Reading through the Bible in one year, April 9th, Leviticus 17 through 18, Proverbs 15, 15 through 33, Luke 24, 1 through 35, and 1 Timothy 5 through 6. Lots of chapters today. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons and to all the people of Israel, and say to them, This thing that the Lord has commanded, or this is the thing that the Lord has commanded. If any one of the house of Israel kills an ox or a lamb or a goat in the camp or kills it outside the camp and does not bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting to offer it as a gift to the Lord in front of the tabernacle of the Lord, blood guilt shall be imputed to that man. He has shed blood, and that man shall be cut off from among his people. This is to the end that uh, the people of Israel may bring their sacrifices that they sacrifice in the open field, that they may bring them to the Lord, to the priests at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and sacrifice them as sacrifices of peace offerings to the Lord. And the priest shall throw the blood of, um, throw the blood on the altar of the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting and burn the fat for a pleasing aroma to the Lord. So they shall no more sacrifice their sacrifices to goat demons after whom they whore. This shall be a statute forever for them throughout their generations. And you shall say to them, shall anyone, sorry, anyone of the house of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn among them, who offers a burnt offering or sacrifice and does not bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting to offer it to the Lord, that man shall be cut off from his people. If any one of the house of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn among them eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood and will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. Therefore, I have said to the people of Israel, No person among you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger who sojourns among you eat blood. Any one of the people of Israel, or of the strangers who sojourn among them, who takes in hunting any beast or bird that may be eaten, shall pour out its blood or cover it with earth. So, and cover it with earth. For the life of every creature is in its blood. Its blood is its life. Therefore, I have said to the people of Israel, you shall not eat the blood of any creature, for the life of every creature is its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off, and every person who eats of what dies of itself or what is torn by beasts, whether he is a native or a sojourner, shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. Then he shall be clean. But if he does not wash them or bathe his flesh... He shall bear his iniquity. Really makes you wonder about when they used to do bloodletting, right? Um, that's obviously not a Christian thing that came about. It was from um, kind of Greek mythology about humors, meeting different liquids in the body, how to uh, equalize them and all of that. So, yeah, definitely, definitely that's not a, uh, a Christian right. All right. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do as they did, sorry, as they do in the land of Egypt, where you lived, and you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan, to which I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You shall follow my rules and keep my statutes and walk in them. I am the Lord your God. So he's saying this is his authority in saying these things. You shall therefore keep my statutes, excuse me, my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. None of you shall approach any one of his close relatives to uncover nakedness. I am the Lord. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father, which is the nakedness of your mother. He belongs to her. She is your mother. You shall not uncover her nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife. It is your na- sorry, it is your father's nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your sister, your father's daughter, or your mother's daughter, whether brought up in the family or in another home. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your son's daughters, sorry, your son's daughter or your daughter's daughter, for their nakedness is your own nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife, uh, wife's daughter, brought up in your family, sorry, in your father's family, since she is your sister. 
You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's sister, she is your father's relative. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your mother's sister, for she is your mother's relative. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's brother, for, Mm -hmm. sorry, that is, you shall not approach his wife, she is your aunt. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your daughter-in-law, she is your son's wife. You shall not uncover her nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your brother's wife, for it is your brother's um, nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of a woman and of her daughter, and you shall not take her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter to uncover her nakedness. They are relatives. It is depravity. Again, this is what was happening in Canaan, and this was also what was happening in um, Egypt from which they came. They're saying separate yourselves entirely from these things. And you shall not take a woman as a rival wife to her sister, uncovering her nakedness while her sister is still alive. You shall not approach a woman to uncover her nakedness while she is in her menstrual uncleanness. You shall not lie sexually with your neighbor's wife, and so make yourself unclean with her. You shall not give any of your children to offer them to Molech. Um, This is in today's parlance. Uh, Molech was a god that you would um, typically sacrifice children to so that you would have wealth or that um, you would have, uh, your job would go well for you. Um, Things would continue to uh, progress for you. You would have, um, you know, a great life, whatever. Anything that you were trying to succeed in, you could do now. In today's parlance, this is abortion, where women sacrifice their children on the altar of, I'm just not ready. Or I just want to, um, you know, I'm I'm really focused on my career right now. I don't want to be a mother, or you know, I don't I don't want to get married, or any of these other reasons. That is the exact same thing as offering your children to Molech, and why not? Because that profanes the name of God. Because we are created in His image, we are image bearers with God in the Imago Dei. I am the Lord. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. You shall not lie with any animal, and so make yourself unclean with it. Neither shall any woman give herself to an animal to lie with it. It is perversion. Do not make yourselves unclean by any of these things. For by all of these, the nations I am driving out before you have become unclean, and the land became unclean, so that I punished its iniquity." And the land vomited out its inhabitants. But you shall keep my statutes and my rules and do none of these abominations, either the native or the sojourn, sorry, or the stranger who sojourns among you. For the people of the land who were, uh, sorry, who were before you did all of these abominations so that the land became unclean, lest the land vomit you out uh, when you make it unclean as it vomited out the nation that was before you. Everyone who does any of these abominations, the, pe- the sorry, the persons who do them shall be cut off from among their people. So keep my charge never to practice any of these abominable cu- uh, customs that were practiced before you. And never to make yourselves unclean by them. I am the Lord your God. Now Proverbs 15, 15 through 33. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but the heart of say, but the cheerful of heart has a continual feast. Better is a little, um, excuse me. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure in troubles with it. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fatted ox and hatred with it. A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets contention. The way of a sluggard, the lazy, is like a hedge of thorns, but the path of the upright is a level highway. A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish man despises his mother. Folly is a joy to him who lacks sense, but a man of understanding walks straight ahead. Without counsel, plans fail, 
but with many advisors they succeed. To make an apt answer is a joy to a man, and a word in season how good it is. The path of life leads sorry the path of life leads upward for the prudent that he may turn away from uh, from sheol beneath The Lord tears down the house of the proud but maintains the widow's boundaries The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord but gracious words are pure Whoever is greedy for unjust gain troubles his own household, but he who hates bribes will live. The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. That's a common theme, that God won't hear the prayer of, of an unrighteous person, and he won't hear the prayer of somebody who isn't, um, well, who isn't converted. The only prayer that God hears from an unconverted person is a prayer of repentance. The light of the eyes rejoices the heart, and good news refreshes the bones. The ear that listens to life-giving reproof or correction will dwell among the wise. Whoever ignores instruction despises himself, but he who listens to reproof gains intelligence. The fear of the Lord is instruction and wisdom, and humility comes before honor. Now Luke 24, 1-35. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb. This is talking about the women beforehand who had uh, had come with him from Galilee, followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid, and they returned and prepared uh, spices and ointments. So here it is, now on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. At early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed, sorry, yeah, and as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now, it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But the words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping in, and, sorry, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves. And he went home marveling what had happened. That very day, two of them, this is two of the disciples, or two of the followers who were with Jesus, not those of the apostles. Um, So they were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about these things and what had happened. While they were talking and discussing them together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened uh, there these days? He said to them, What things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a mighty prophet, sorry, a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things have happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that uh, they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. 
Now, some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, Oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. It was nece- sorry, was it not necessary that the, pri- that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were open, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road? While he opened to us the scriptures? And they arose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were, uh, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed. He has appeared to, sorry, and has appeared to Simon. And they told what had happened to him on the road. And how he was um, known to them in the breaking of the bread. Okay, so now I'm going to just scroll through here. Because it was kind of hung up on some notes. So that if you want to stop and read the notes, you certainly can. There we go. Okay, now 1 Timothy 5 through 6. Again, these are instructions for Timothy as an elder for how he should conduct himself. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters in all purity. Honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return for the, uh, sorry to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. She who is truly a widow, left all alone, meaning that she has no um, her husband has now died and she doesn't have any children anymore to take care of her, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Command these things as well, so that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Let a widow be enrolled, meaning enrolled in the daily distribution. Um, This is um, food and sometimes money um, that was given out by the church. Uh, to take care of the needs of people in the community. Um, kind of like welfare, but it was run by the church um, because they had no one to take care of them. If if you were a widow who lost your husband um, and your children or you didn't have any children uh, to take care of you, you weren't able to really work on your own, uh, especially in this day and age. So you couldn't um, generate enough income to cover your needs. So the church would then step in and take care of those people. So this is what the enrollment means. So let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age and has, sorry, having been the wife of one husband and having a reputation for good works. If she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, meaning has taken care of the saints, um, has cared for the afflicted and has devoted herself to every good work but refuse to enroll younger widows. For when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, saying what they should not. So I would have younger widows marry, Bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary, Satan, no occasion for slander. For some have already strayed after Satan. And if any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. 
Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows. Let elders rule. Um, sorry, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor. Now, basically saying let them get paid extra. Um, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. Do not admit a charge against an older sorry, an elder, except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the rest may stand in fear. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands or take uh, part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Now, the hasty and laying on of hands means um, don't rush to um, to put someone into the work of the ministry. Give them some time. See how they work this out. I've seen plenty of pastors who um, have been a kind of uh, foisted up into um, positions of authority within a church because they have... Uh, Either they speak really well, or maybe they're good with finances, and the church needs somebody who can do that. Um, and I've seen that happen before, and it ends badly when that person later uh, is found out to be a false convert. And maybe they've been stealing from the church because they were never Christian to begin with. Um, or maybe they've been leading other people uh, to believe things that aren't true. So... No longer drink only water. Now, this is a thing for him personally because he was having stomach issues. Now, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. The sins of some people are conspicuous, going before them to judgment, but the sins of others appear later. So also, good works are conspicuous, even those that are not, sorry, that cannot remain hidden. Let all who are under a yoke as bondservants or slaves Regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God, again, his character and nature being shown through us, and the teaching may not be reviled. Those who have been, sorry, those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. Teach and urge these things. If anyone teaches a do sorry a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound works or sorry words um, of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, and he is puffed up with sorry he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing, he has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words, which produce which produce envy, dissension, slander evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness, meaning becoming like God, our sanctification process, um, with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But we have food and clothing, and with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Instead, pursuing righteousness godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who um, is the blessed and only sovereign, 
the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge, for by professing it some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. And that is that. So behold the word of the Lord.